Usually, before I go shaking my tits for the press, I like to go see how the professionals do it. Some might say the chief of police has no business in an institution like this. But in fact, it's the quietest and safest place in town. You won't run into any reporters, nobody gets into any fights, nobody drinks too much, nobody even raises their voice. The place is owned by an elderly gentleman who knows how to keep things under control. That's why I never invite my friends here. I wanted to make an exception for my 60th birthday, but most of my colleagues are young enough to be my sons, and they'd rather just hire prostitutes. Why stare at some boobs when you can take the whole package for yourself? But there's none of that in our club. Even looking too long is considered indecent. You can get an occasional glimpse, like by accident. The rest of the time you just pretend that you're immersed in conversation, or just come by for a drink. Doesn't mean these gentlemen wouldn't want their bald heads smothered in tits. It's just that nobody says it out loud. My younger colleagues might call it hypocrisy, but I call it the good old-fashioned manners. Good manners and leave the rest unsaid. She agrees to unbutton her blouse, and we agree not to pay too much attention. The girls are on a quiet prowl, too. They're looking for a way out of their cramped rooms. Maybe make friends with some wealthy patron with a pacemaker and dentures. Everybody wants something. But we have to control ourselves, or we'll all turn into libertines and prostitutes. Hell, if there weren't any rules, I'd be belching and farting, jumping up on the table, arms held high, yelling, Shake it, baby! <laughs> No idea how I got so barbaric. When I was a kid, my father sometimes told me at bedtime that if I closed my eyes and didn't open them for a long time, all the demons would blow away. Yesterday I turned 60, but I still take his advice. Not because I'm sentimental or want to keep the memory of my father alive. I just can't think of a better solution. To get away from all the demons that haunt Freeburg, I'd need to wear a blindfold 24-7. Plus, it's a good idea to act blind when talking to reporters. At least, that's what my colleagues say. They're afraid of press conferences. But for me, it's more like a confessional. No matter what lies you tell, you're privately thinking the honest answers. It helps me remember who I am. The fact that I'll be reading all about it in the papers tomorrow is a small price to pay. Call it penance for the preacher. This is the first time I'm afraid of those answers my mind has given me. Not because I'm mad I'm losing my job. Though it's true, I'm mad as hell. Not because I subconsciously blame everyone else. Though I damn sure do blame them. And don't even ask me what my next move is. I can't imagine. 
but even that doesn't scare me. The worst thing is, I know I'm gonna have to do something, and I'll be damned if I know how far I'll go. I may have a lot of vices, but predictability isn't one of them. I learned a long time ago how to drive away the swarming demons. But what do you do when they're trying to rip your soul from your skin? Shutting my eyes tight as I can. The best solution remains the same. Play blind. I just hope the reporters think I was blinded by the camera flash. How's the back today, Mr. Boyd? Same as usual. How did the press conference go? You can read about it in the newspapers tomorrow. Don't let anyone in. Even Mr. Kendrick? Especially Mr. Kendrick. As soon as I heard the door creak, I knew what face I'd see. When I tell Emma not to let anyone in, there's only one man it could be. Rude, arrogant, no warning. That's Mayor Rogers in a nutshell. White summer shoes, white socks, white shorts, white polo shirt, and the white smile of a hungry shark. Mayor Rogers enters every room like he owns the place. Even the floorboards under his feet sound like they're creaking an apology. He never shied away from the odd corruption scheme. It's like the devil walks behind him. In the movies, the villains controlling the city play golf with the judges. Rogers plays tennis with them instead. That's about the only difference. Jack, I was hoping to catch you after the press conference. You, uh, you ran away so quick. There's no smoking at City Hall. No reason for me to hang around. Well, this morning I signed a ban on smoking in all public buildings. Soon you won't be able to smoke here either. <laughs> Soon enough I won't be here at all. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. 
The people of this city like you, Jack. The police chief of all people. <laughs> don't, uh, don't betray that, Jack. Don't get wrapped up in any schemes. Sit nice and quiet for the next 180 days, and, uh, and you'll be remembered as a hero. That's the only thing that you still have left. Be the hero. Then how am I supposed to scrape together a retirement fund? You had a million chances to secure a luxury pension, one that even I would have envied, although I've never set aside any money for myself. I'm not planning to retire any time soon. One hundred and eighty days of quiet, Jack. That's all I need. I don't have any problems with you, and you won't have any problems with me. I have a new assistant, Troy Starr. If you have something to tell me, call him. But try not to bother him. He's a, he's a busy man. <laughs> I'll do my best. And quit smoking up the office. One of my friends will be using it soon. Oh, I'm sorry, babe. Only the mayor has this number. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, is this Troy Star? Yes. Go fuck yourself, Troy Star. <laughs> Cops don't use the police station cafeteria anymore. There's some kind of stigma against sitting shoulder to shoulder with your partners. Everybody just takes snacks from the machines or grabs a meal and hammers it down in the corner like a vulture on a corpse. The main thing? Don't look into anyone's eyes. Could be construed as an invitation to sit together. The only people eaten here are ghosts. My deputy, Francis Kendrick, he recently became one of those ghosts. The subject of one of the most devastating corruption scandals in the history of Freeburg. No evidence to support the accusations, but everyone knows Kendrick's days are numbered. I need that file I asked for. Needs to be ready tonight. Francis didn't say anything, but I understood. Ghosts aren't supposed to talk. Besides, I got a feeling he was already finished.
to stay late at the office, he liked to grumble and crack wise. Nowadays, he doesn't have the strength for it. Slumped shoulders, blank stare, wrinkled skin. The past few weeks, I don't hardly recognize my old friend. In his younger years, he reminded me of a gallant royal officer in an old Kipling story. Kendrick isn't just crumbling under the weight of the public pressure, but from the shame of it all. Internal Affairs raided the library he inherited from his grandfather, hoping they'd find buckets of cash stashed in the pages. Heard about the look on his face, the fearless policeman standing helpless in horror. I've known Francis for thirty years. The past twenty years he's played loose with the law. And I know that at a certain point every stolen dollar brings more misery than anything else. Probably sounds crazy, but I sympathize with the guy. What can I do? Your friends are your friends, and these are the waters we swim in. Called all of the people on that list today. Now they know you're in business. So you could get a call from any of them. You don't need to worry about any of them. I've cleared them all. And what kind of business are we talking here? It's nothing too serious, just like you asked. Should be just a few small favors. Payments will vary depending on the situation and who you're dealing with. How much are you looking to earn? Half a million. Half a million? Why not a whole million? Because everybody wants to take a million. Figured I'd try something different. Half a million in 180 days? Well, you could earn it all above board if you netted all the big fish and hit all your bonuses. Never knew you for a fisherman. Well, you never got into my business, and I'm not trying to get into yours. But be careful about bringing in any other cops. Sooner or later, they'll put the finger on you. And, and one more thing, Jack. I remember what you said, but I should probably add one more name to that list. Christopher Sand. Sand. Christopher G. Sand. Everyone knows the name, but few could tell you who he is. The old man stays away from the spotlight. Always wears old-fashioned jeans and knitted sweaters. Gives to charity. Rarely attends social events. An avid hunter, I hear. Even dabbles in poetry. You'd never guess he's the head of the oldest and most powerful gang in the city. Goes back as far as his great-grandfather. And Sand is strict about following the old rules. He rarely involves himself in commonplace murders and robberies. Hardly needs to intimidate anyone to get his point across. The people who work for him each have their sphere. They provide protection where needed, even work with the authorities when they want to make a deal. Meanwhile, Sand pulls the strings without getting his hands dirty. People sometimes mistake his quiet approach. A couple years ago, an arms dealer decided to expand its business without asking permission, and his whole family paid the price. In four weeks, Sand killed 31 people, old men, women, even a few teenagers. And Sand's people made sure every paper reported it. Frank, I don't want to hear you say that name again. Jack, please, listen to me. I'm in with these guys. We agreed, Frank. That's not the kind of business I'm into. I don't go there. Never have, never will.
Whenever I'm alone at home, and there's a knock at the door, I always hope it'll be my wife, Laura. She's always forgetting her keys. Hello, my name is Steve, and you're Jack Boyd, is that right? To get to my front door, the Bible boys walked about a mile from the local bus stop, jumping over mud puddles and skirting a couple of landfills. Laura doesn't go in for religion either. But according to her, these brave lunatics with their fake smiles deserve at least a minute of attention. She patiently listens to them, asks them questions, regales them with pastries, and never once dropping a hint of condescension. When I watch her do it, I've got to admit it gets me. I'd have hugged those boys, sat with them on the porch, and lit up a cigar. But a month after Laura left, all I could do was quietly ask them not to bother me. Today I'm a little rougher still. Shut the door in his nose this time. Another couple weeks at this rate and I'll be greeting anyone who comes close with my service pistol pointed towards the sky, ready to fire my warning shots. In my life, even the basic stuff never goes like it's supposed to. Normally when a wife is going to leave home, she'll make a scene or at least sit everyone down for a serious conversation. But Laura just disappeared. The children in the stories always stand on the side of the mother, but all three of our sons supported me. The in-laws always blame the husband for making their daughter unhappy. But now Sally, Laura's mother, well, we sort of have a pact. The fellow Laura ran off with is young enough to be her son. I hear he's 30 years old. Of all the possible information a man can know about his wife's lover, I get hit with that. Fortunately, Laura's mother doesn't like the way it sounds either. Sally figures this guy just thought he'd have some fun with a mature woman, but he'll be back chasing college girls before the year is out. So we have an agreement. Sally's going to track down Laura and try to reason with her, and we'll arrange a meeting. Meanwhile, I'm supposed to not do anything stupid, which of course means anything at all. It's a crazy situation. I'm the police chief, and the person I'm trusting to find my wife is an old woman armed with a phone book. But I can't afford to lose Sally as an ally. So for the moment, I had to swallow my pride. Hello. Mrs. Markham, this is Boyd. Oh, is there any news? That's what I wanted to ask you. Have you found anything? An address? Phone number? Have you spoken to her? Don't worry, Jack. I've narrowed the range to two suspects, or whatever you like to say at your police building. At my police building, we find people faster than a funny old woman chirping on the phone with my wife's girlfriends. Oh, you're an old man, Jack. Come to your senses. They'd give us straight odds on the street. But I've got more energy, Jack. Maybe you think I'm a foolish old woman, but I go to my book club, argue with the girls about Byron, and it gives me energy. I talk to my dogs, and it gives me energy. And you have nothing, Jack. You don't even have a hobby. You got no passion. It's why Laura left you. Let's not go back into that, Sally. Find my wife, and we can discuss my hobbies later. 
I'm waiting for your call, and my patience is running thin. Laura, if you've stopped loving me, I'll let you go. I can't expect the impossible from you. Just don't let me die out here, okay? <laughs> Sister Kay, she's just a dancing queen. Fit for a king, a swing, sweet ginger, swing, sweet ginger green.